Eagles, Jags. We'll talk some NFL. By the way, we got some text messages coming in on what starter jackets you had. This guy says North Carolina Tar Heels, but he wants us to pronounce the word armoire. Armoire. There you go. Is that hard? Is there any other way to say it? Armoire. No. I mean, you could enunciate it in more of an accent, accentuate it. Armoire. But it's really armoire or armoire. Armoire. It's, it's not armor. Okay. Jaguars Jeff, is the equivalent of armor. how are you saying armoire? I, I actually try not to. I quit about 10 years ago. <laughs> There's only one way to say armoire, right? Uh, I don't know. I haven't said armoire probably there you go. 10 or 15 years, but yeah, I think I think it's just armoire. Well, what about the team that the armoire. Eagles are playing? How do you pronounce that? Yeah, can we get it back to the Jaguars, please? What? No, I don't. I've always wondered the same thing. Why, why do they? Why do people say Jaguars? I don't get it. I, I'm just. I'm with you guys. No, no, it's it's only me. Josh and Mike are violators. They say Jaguars. I say it, but I don't know why. I don't know what no, the origin I know, is. I know, and I'm, I I heard you guys. I heard you guys discussing it earlier, and I'm I'm you're right. I, I'm with you, Aidan. I don't understand these. I feel like Northeast people heard other people from other parts of the country say it and just figured we should <laughs> jump on that boat we and, should be uh, different. Bandwagon and copy them because <laughs> nobody up here would ever call the Jaguars the Jaguars. That sounds a little hokey. Yeah, it almost sounds like hokey. the Alabamian. Wait, did you hear country. me say that and ask me or were you just assuming I say it? You said it in the beginning. Before. Okay. Yeah, right, You were paying attention. That's good. Absolutely. I listen to what you say. Uh, well, well, Mike, Mike went to West Virginia, so Mike, I can understand if you picked up a little bit of a hokey jargon in your bit. college days because you went to school in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, but I was in Nashville for two and a half <laughs> years, and I didn't come back sounding like Jaguars. Well, no one's going to change you, Aton. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what starter jacket did you have? Um, that might be a threat to how I'm currently perceived uh, among Philadelphians and the Philadelphia oh. No, listen, I, I came out and I said the best one ever was the L.A. Kings, and Josh agrees. Uh, did I, yeah, yeah. The I Kings had a Charlotte, I had the I old school Charlotte Hornets, L.J. Grandmama one yeah, with that yeah. green, that light green. Everybody, everybody I knew who, you know, decided not to be partisan for a starter jacket got either the Charlotte Hornets one or yep. even the San Jose Sharks. Because of that teal color that was so hot yeah. back in the 90s. No, yeah. you're right, man. That was huge. That well, you had, one was huge. When we were growing up, that's when you had Jacksonville, you had Carolina. So everyone was getting, like, Carolina Panthers gear or Jacksonville Jaguars gear or nice. San Jose Sharks gear. Like, yeah, that was like – and, like, <laughs> the Arizona Diamondbacks, the, the Marlins, they were all, like – Think about that. They were new teams when we were yeah. growing up. Like, the concept of a brand-new team – was all happening back then. What a time to be alive. I know. I was watching the uh, World Series the other night and just kind of thinking about the oddity of a team like, even though the Rockies aren't in it, but I remember when the Rockies and Marlins joined the National League and uh, how excited people were for two new baseball teams. Do you remember who and pitched opening day for the Marlins? Do, you know, do you remember who the opening day pitcher was for the Marlins? Oh man! It would ha all right. So they were an expansion team. There had to be an expansion draft. Had to be pro probably an old guy. Yep. <sighs> man, Kevin, Kevin Brown. You're huffing no, down the right path. That bad mm. See what I did there? Oh man! Your uncle Charlie would know this. You don't have an uncle Charlie. Right? He used to play. Was he an Indian? No, I just no. gave no, you I the think name. Uncle Charlie, but Charlie Manuel. <laughs> no, <laughs> I got. I gave you the name no. indirectly. Your uncle Charlie, and you're huffing down the oh. right path. No, are you kidding me, Charlie Huff? Charlie Huff? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, I wouldn't have gotten that for a million years. Do you remember who the <laughs> first pick of the expansion draft was by the Rockies? Do you remember? Does anybody remember? I'm doing this all off the top of my head. Tulowitzki? No. The expansion draft. No, what year no, was no. that? It would be like no. It would be like Dante Bichetti. No, Dante, not, Bichette, uh, Bichette, no. Dante Bichette was. It wouldn't be Larry Bichette. Walker. He was actually a, a Rocky, but he wasn't the first pick of the expansion draft. This guy got picked from the Braves. Right. He was a pitcher. Ooh. I think we're off the uh, rails. No. I have uh, no idea. Oh, man, no. I, I can't remember. His name was David Need. Who was it? 
Dave Need. Dave was, Need. Yeah, how did you I even get here? Him. I think he was what? a former Mets farmhand. How did you even get I, here I to asking da- about Mets David farm. Need? I don't know. We we're talking about expansion teams <laughs> okay. and then the first pitcher in Marlins opening. No, day. I know. I didn't even know how we got to expansion teams because of the, oh, starter, the starter jacket. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and all I remember was 1994. Dante Bichette and Vinny Castilla were just bomb. I mean, that team was atrocious from the pitching standpoint. But yes, they the were Blake bombers, Street Bombers. They were called the Blake Street that's right. Bombers. That's right. You know, when I was a kid, 1989, I'm 12 years old, and we have our like our little league baseball district team. And one of the kids on our team's grandfather, he gave us a baseball card of Dante Bichette. He gave one to every single player on our team. It was in hard plastic, and he told us, this guy's going to be great. So during the whole tournament, we kept this baseball card in the back pants of our uh, baseball pants. And Dante Bichette, I don't know that he ever turned out to be the player that we thought when he was hanging around our baseball pants all this time, but (laughs) he, he stuck with us for the whole summer. He was supposed to be really big, right? Uh, he Andres Galarraga was, was on that team. That's right, the big cat. Yes. That was, I'm telling you, that team could really hit the ball. Vinny Castilla. And you kept baseball cards in your back pocket. Yes. Tim Raines kept something else in his back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you were a kid, you used to ride your bike to the baseball card store. You'd hang out there all day long. Think about this concept. We watch, or kids watch other kids play video games now. Back then, we used to watch people open up their packs of baseball cards. Remember that? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Playing flip, too. That's right. All right, man. Let's get into this game a little bit. You got the Eagles and Jags, uh, 930 in the morning. It's a little odd. It's odd for both these teams to get their season back on track. Let me ask you this. When you look at Philadelphia, Jeff, getting ready for this game, and, you know, quite frankly, I'm not saying it's a must-must win, but if they lose this game, you're going to be in some some big-time trouble. Um is this the right opponent? Do you think that, man, thankfully they're playing Jacksonville here, or do you think this is a bad matchup for the way the Eagles are going right now? you got two teams that are t- technically having similar problems. Yeah, I, I don't think this is the right matchup. I think that a lot of people will look at it and see that because the Jaguars have lost, what, three in a row, and they're playing very they're very poorly. And the Eagles, you know, they lose a game that they should have won last week. They beat the Giants pretty handily the week before and they think it's easy to get back on track. But um, there's two things. One, I, I'm, I'm a big law of averages guy, whereas when you're playing a team that's lost three in a row and playing poorly, everybody just expects that to continue. And I, I always look to say, well, you know, they're, it's going to catch up. They're going to put it together at some point and play better. And B, and I don't think you can, you can understate this enough, the Jaguars have been to Wembley Stadium in London. This will be their sixth straight year. They're very familiar with it. They play very well there for whatever reason. The last three games, they've scored 34 points, 30 points, and 44 points. Blake Bortles has been – I mean, there's a reason why Shad Khan wants to move this team to London. His team plays like Super Bowl champions there. His quarterback is awesome there, and he can't even play well on American soil. (laughs) So I look at this and say, you know what, Doug's got to bring this to – this is the first time the Eagles have been to London in the 12-year history that they started doing this. Thing. Doug's handled West Coast travel well. Uh, this is a different animal. So there's experience that the Jaguars have. They play well there. Uh, and I do think the Jaguars' defense, although the box score doesn't show it, uh, they are a lot better than they're given credit for. And the Eagles are a little banged up on the offensive line. I, I feel like it's a recipe for a bad day for the Eagles. I really do. Yeah, Jeff, honestly, I, I was on uh, 29 this morning and I predicted a loss. Still think that way that the Eagles are going to lose. And You laid out a lot of positives about the Blake Bortles-led offense, if you will, in London, which seems like a completely different football team. On the flip side, just trying to think of ways to kind of counter my pessimism ahead of it. You know, just covering the league and and how professional sports work, that when you're struggling or not living up to expectations at home, sometimes if you're on the road, and in this case there's no place farther away from Philadelphia than London— then you look around and think, all right, now's a chance to kind of exhale. That pressure really is off, no matter how much Doug talks about it. Do you think that can help a little bit of an off-the-field push in the Eagles' momentum that they're kind of away from home in this one? I mean, are they really, though? They're away from home, but it sounds like, you know, uh, you know, 30% of Philadelphia has already made the trip 
Yeah, yeah but, you know, you don't have people like you sticking microphones in their faces and asking questions and stuff. There is yeah, some media I, there. But, but I'm saying, like, it, it's you die. Hold on a second. Do I really need to explain the difference between playing in front of 70,000 fans and the local media? No, but my point, I understand your question, Aton, but what I'm saying is if the Eagles fall behind 10 nothing in this game, they're going to hear True. it from a True. lot of Eagles fans as opposed to if they were falling 10 behind to the Houston Texans in Houston. Hey, you know what? More like, you're, you're right. Food, you're just hearing the other team cheer you know, I, I was trying to bring up a point of positivity to kind of counter what I was thinking of the game, and you just ruined it. So thank you for confirming my pessimism. I appreciate that. Well, I, we were talking with uh, Billy you know, Osborne on Monday show. On air. And, and, and we were talking to Billy Osborne on Monday show, and he was talking about how this game is similar to what you go through for a Super Bowl, where people are asking you for tickets nonstop, the travel. There's a lot of media, extra media that you do that you don't typically do during yeah. a regular season game. And that Jacksonville, as you kind of chronicled, has gone through this whole London thing before. Right. And here's another interesting thing on top of that, that Ozzy told me. He actually played at Wembley Stadium when he was uh, involved with NFL Europe. And he said that the track there tends to be very fast, like a, uh, a dome surface, an indoor surface, the grass a little bit um, uh, sheener, a little wetter and easier to run on. And, you know, if you look at what's hurt the Eagles um, so far this year is, you know, obviously receivers underneath that soft coverage. And Jacksonville has – some fairly decent receiving weaponry. You wouldn't think about it, but, you know, a guy like Keelan Cole and D.D. Westbrook, they've made some big plays through the air this year. And if you give them that slight advantage against the Eagles, who have given up a lot of, I think, the six most yards in the NFL to wide receivers, it's just another reason to think, man, you know, this, this whole game in London, Wembley Stadium, everything that's already tipping the scales in favor of Jacksonville from experience, well, that just adds another part of it. Uh, the Jeff Eagles don't have feed. Yeah, you know, I mean Alshon Jeffrey is their best receiver, but he's not going to capitalize on a on a dome track the yeah. way like D.D. Westbrook right. would. All right, well, hypothesize if you will, then the story of Nelson Aguilar this year. What what's the problem? Well, I don't think the problem is him. To be honest with you, I, I you know he caught a screen against the Panthers. You guys remember it was like kind of a middle screen, and he pinballed his way through. The, he, he spun twice. It was like he was hitting the uh, what's it, the C button on that, and I forget which one makes you spin. But he looked really good, looked elusive when they got him in the ball with good blocking ahead of him in that uh, in that regard. So I don't think he's not the player. He's clearly a bigger part of the running game as far as being a jet sweep motion guy intended to deceive or throw off the defense a little bit. And he's not because they're rotating him between outside, inside, outside, inside. I just don't think the routes that he's running this year are similar to the ones that he was running last year. And that's obviously by design by Doug Peterson and trying to use him differently. But I agree with you guys in that the difference between last year's team and this year's team and a 28.2 points per game and only 22 points per game is that, Nelson, there is no third option. There's Alshon Jeffrey, there's Zach Ertz, and there hasn't been much more. And I think that Nelson, they need to get him back in the slot back running those vertical routes in zones or, or even, uh, you know, crossing patterns on man to lose the coverage and put him in space and let him function because I think he's still really good at it. They're just not using him that way. But if they don't find somebody to be a third option, whether it's Nelson or whether it's this running game, then they're going to be too one-dimensional with Ertz and Jeffrey, and you can't get away with that week after week after week. Jeff, three weeks ago, Doug Peterson said, Darren Sproles is close to returning. What's gone wrong or, or what's happening? <laughs> um, the only thing I could say is that it's, it's a severe hamstring strain. And obviously it's a little bit of a tear if that happened. And so it's going to just be a little bit longer. It's going to be probably a week. I, I suspect he'll be able to practice a little bit, probably limited next week. And then hopefully he'll be out by after the bye against the Cowboys. I don't remember what he looks like. <laughs> Are they? Me neither. Nobody else does either. <laughs> no, but seriously, are they looking at his return as that boost to the offense? In other words, can Howie say, I'm going to focus on getting a guy on defense because we're getting Sproles back, or is that short-sighted? I think, yeah, yeah. I think that would be short -sighted. Well, here's the thing. I think that it's certainly rational and reasonable to say when he comes back, he will help this offense, especially from maybe a third down standpoint. But – 
uh, on the flip side, uh, you know, I don't think Howie's not making any moves because he knows Darren Sproles is in the back in a week or two. And if, he's, if there's an opportunity to get somebody to help the running back core, I'm certain that Howie will try to do it. You know, we hear that a lot, like in baseball. Like, right. I don't need to make a trade for a pitcher because we're getting this guy back, you know, after a certain date, you know. And I'm wondering, you know, if Howie says, all right, we're going to get Sproles back, so let me go get a corner or let me go get a defensive tackle because we're adding uh, to that that spot on the team. But the trade deadline, they're in an interesting spot, Jeff. The deadline's Tuesday, and they're playing a game in mm-hmm. London right now to try to get back, to travel. I mean, that's going to be an interesting conundrum for Howie to try to work everything out if he wants to get something done for Tuesday. Well, not only that, but think about the difference in mentality that Howie may be having after Sunday compared to the last three weeks of let's buy, let's buy, let's try to find somebody to help us. And then maybe potentially the we're three and five. If we lose to the Jaguars, let's sell. And, you know, it's, I don't like to count a team out and I wouldn't, even though I do think that the Eagles will lose to the Jags and fall to three and five. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 2006 when they were four and seven and completely out of it, and then reeled off five straight wins with Jeff Garcia, nine and seven won the division. So I, I will not count the Eagles out, even if they are three and five. But Howie has to look at some of his the players on his team. You know, Ronald Darby is he going to commit to Ronald Darby after this year? Uh, Jalen Mills is he going to get an extension after this year? There's there's some guys who are up for extensions, some guys who are just going to be free agents. Brandon Graham. Yeah, that's the name I was going to ask you. Walk after this year. What do you think happens I mean, I don't with him? I think he would do it, but with Brandon? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Howie would keep him because you have to look at everything from a, a return standpoint. Unless if you lose Brandon Graham, there's a pretty, I would say, the likelihood of you getting a fourth or maybe even a third round compensatory pick in return is pretty good. No lower than four, I would think. Um, probably somewhere in the fourth. So someone's going to have to give you more than a fourth-round pick to get, I would think, to, to make Howie want to give up Brandon Graham. And I don't know if someone's going to give up a first, second, or third pick for a guy who's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. Well, you can't, unless they know that they can extend, extend the contract. How much do you think Derek Barnett's injury, inability to really see him consistently throughout this year, will play a role in what they do with Brandon Graham? Almost if Barnett was shining – eight games, then you'd look and say, eh, maybe it's a little bit easier to swallow the Brandon Graham doesn't resign here, Pill. Yeah, but I mean, that's, well, that's another thing with, with the depth that they once had and now they don't with Derek Barnett. If Howie doesn't want to be in seller's mode because he still thinks that they can win a bad division, he might be prone to holding on to Brandon Graham unless somebody obviously comes along and knocks his socks off. It's really hard to be... It's really hard to win the Super Bowl and then tell your fans, hey, we're selling, right? I mean, that, that makes it hard to pull a trigger on a deal like that. Well, it's a good point. If you're Mike. not mathematically, I mean, hard, if you're not mathematically uh, out of it. Yeah, that's true. Because you won't be by Tuesday. If, right. If you get a great offer, I don't think anybody's going to kill you for it. Like, let's say somebody gave the Eagles a, a two for either Brandon or Ronald Darby and they pull the trigger, I mean, you talk about this area and selling it. Remember when Ruben Amaro Jr. kept old guys together that weren't performing well and yeah. not criticized for it? If you pull it off an old guy for a high pick, now you get the maximum value, people would be hypocritical to say, well, hey, what are you doing, you know? Yeah, I, I, I'm, and the interesting part about that is we talked a little bit about this the other day, is that in football – 29 years old turns into 35 years old really fast. Like you're old. Like one season you're yeah. you're the man, and then the next season you're old. And we talked about Connor Barwin. Like one year Barwin double digit sacks. He's all over the place, and the next year he just looks slower and older. And the Eagles have a bunch of guys that are right in that spot where at at the drop of a hat you could turn into the old slow guy really fast. Yeah, I mean, I think that we talk about Jason Peters as being that guy who looked really good in, in preseason and training camp and came back from the injury and looked, uh, you know, exceptionally athletic, but he also didn't play a whole lot at all, actually, in the preseason. And then, you know, uh, he's, he got the quad injury and now the floor biceps. And even without those, he didn't look exactly like the Jason Peters that we were have seen in the past. And, of course, Darren Sproles, you bring him back. Uh, didn't have to, you know. They really said they wanted to bring him back. They loved his leadership, loved what he brought to the team, and you know he's been out for six weeks now with 
uh, a hamstring injury, and certainly he's at that age where you, things like that happen as a running back to that age. So uh, it, it, it certainly leaves open to criticism about the number of older guys that they kind of retained and maybe if they did that, a sentimentality. Well, well, it's interesting because, yeah. you know, earlier um, a lot of people like Patrick Peterson right. and say they should give up a first-round pick. He's, what, 28? Which I'm not saying he's an old guy, but 28 to 29 to 30, that changes really fast in a position like that. And I, and I was saying earlier, my buddy who covers the Cardinals out there, he said, to, in his opinion, Peterson looks like – He's not saying he's a bum or that he's washed up. He said, but he could see uh-huh. him getting slower. Like he just feels like he's not the same player that he was his first couple of years, where he was very impactful. He says, I don't think he's nearly the same impactful player. And he's twenty eight. You give up a first round pick to get a guy like that, and the next thing you know, he's Namdi Asamoah. Yeah, you know, I heard you say that um, earlier this week about someone you covered, and, and so it made me kind of ask on and look around and. I did not hear similar reports. So, I, and I, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, for example, who does a great job, I think, for NFL Network and former Eagle Scout, he tweeted the other day that he's been watching their games and thinks that Patrick Peterson has been playing at the top of his game. I think PFF has him there, which, you know, I, I grant it's PFF, you, you never know. But um, I have not seen, like, a football expert or at least that I, I read or, or an analytical site say that his numbers are, are or his production right. is declining or that he looks like a player who's in decline. So No, 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 not that his numbers or production know, I, I, is down. Yeah, it's yeah. just that he looks like he could be, uh-huh. you know, that guy who's 28, and then the next thing you know, he gets to 30, and you're like, ah, oh, he might have lost a, a, a little yeah. bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how many years he has left on contract, but if it's only two, I mean, he's such a, he, he's been such a good player that even if you're getting him for two years, if you think that it helps you win the Super Bowl, I, I think it's worth it. Yeah, it's not you know, to the level of Larry Fitzgerald, but it's getting there. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, you, you seem to think that uh, this is not a good a good matchup, a good fit, a good week to be playing Jacksonville. Yeah, I really don't. Uh, you know, I mean, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before, but I just feel like the easy, low hanging fruit is to say, "Well, the Jaguars really suck. They stink, and you know, the Eagles and they just what." That one stuck there good. I watched some Jaguars tape uh, today, uh, that game that they lost to Houston last week. And, yeah, their offense is really in trouble. Their offensive line stinks. Three pools and happy feet can't even see open receivers. However, I saw some things on that defense, including that line, that front four, that made me think that the Eagles' offensive line could be in for some trouble. Well, they're good against the run. An ugly game versus an ugly game. Yeah, they're, well, they're good against the run. They, you know, they put a lot of pressure on the quarterback. That kid, 91, uh, everybody talks about Clay Campbell, who's awesome, but the kid, Yannick um, Nagoku, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, he's a problem, and he's going to be up against Jason Peters a lot, and that could be problematic. He's a tough, tough the end. Uh, Jeff Mosher, of course, Mosher, McMullen, Krause, Thursday night's landmark, great show last night, and those guys uh, will be back uh, in two Thursdays after the bye week with the uh, latest edition of Mosher, McMullen, and Krause right here on 97.3 ESPN. Tell the listeners, Jeff, how uh, our listeners can find your Eagles coverage. Patreon.com slash Jeff Mosher. It's, uh, I've been covering the Eagles, give you all the in-depth coverage. Just had a great Q&A with Brian Westbrook yesterday on the state of the Eagles running game. And he had some really interesting things to say. Uh, it's only $1.99 a month. You get no ads, no pop-ups. You know, come straight to your email. And, uh, of course, I, I donate to Wounded Warrior Project for every 100 subscribers. Awesome. So we're also donating to a good cause. Oh, I like that. I'd like to read that uh, article with uh, Westbrook to see what he thinks about this Eagle run game. We'll oh, dive into that stuff. a little bit later on as well. Jeff, thanks, man. Thanks, Jim Thanks.